evening, everyone, and welcome to our Power Up panel discussion. My name is Felicia, and I'll be running everything in the background for our session today. We are excited to host today's webinar, and we have a stellar lineup of presenters here for you tonight. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our host for this evening, Brian Balmages. Thank you, Felicia. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm excited to be able to do this and to pair up with so many wonderful folks. Um, for those of you that um, know me, uh, I'm a composer, I am a, a conductor, and that's about all I need to say about myself. I want to focus on the panelists. Um, so I'm going to just very quickly introduce people, and I'm going to go kind of in order uh, that they are on my screen. And I guess as I introduce you guys, you can pop up um, on your video so people can see you. Um, and Christine, you're the first one on my list, so we'll start with you. Um, uh, Christine is uh, the band director at Central Davis High School in Utah. She's also president of the Utah Bandmasters Association. Um, and um, amongst many other things, she has helped uh, with her husband, um, who also, uh, that was Farmington Junior High School. And so she guest conducted on Midwest and also helped with their jazz uh, band program and everything like that. Um, and she's on the advocacy chair for uh, Utah. Um, it's the advocate, it's a music advocacy thing, right? I'm right. Yep. And so um, anyway, and so really excited to have Christine with us. Um, next up, I have Alex uh, Kaminsky. And Alex, uh, a lot of you might know, of course, is the director of bands at Vanderkoek College of Music. Um, I think, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think you still might be one of the only people that has ever taken three three or four different groups to Midwest. Four, four groups four. from three different schools, yeah. Yeah, so three different schools, four different uh, ensembles. So um, rumor has it he knows what he's doing. The other schools were, it was Bucholtz and Stoneman Douglas, um, and I think yeah. Bucholtz went twice. Right, Bugles went twice, and then Lincoln High School in Tallahassee. That's right, and and then also Vandercook. So uh, we're glad to have Alex with us. Uh, Robert Herrings is next. Um, Robert is the director of bands at Henry Middle School in Leander ISD, and Robert is, I think, let's see, fun fact, I think he is the only uh band in texas at, uh, to this date that has won honor band three times in a row upon being eligible i think i got that right um and uh his band has played at midwest um like all the times and um just an all-around wonderful human being i love robert um and so robert is here okay chris meredith is next um, Chris is director of bands at Louisville High School, and prior to this, he was at Shadow Ridge um, Middle School, and they went to Midwest in, let's see, 2018 and 2012. Um, they won the Sudler Cup in 2017. Um, Darcy, you're next. Darcy Williams at Stiles Middle School. Um, and Darcy is, uh, in addition to being director of bands at Stiles, um, who's been to Midwest twice um, in her brief, I think it's like seven years you've been there, seven, eight years, two years, no, 11 years. I know, I know, I know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. And so 11 years. And so, um, but the thing that I love about Darcy is that um, she put it all out there. Her band played at Midwest last year, but she put the whole process out there um, because I think over half of the band that played at Midwest started on Zoom. Um, and so I think for a lot of you that are attending, that's like, okay, this is kind of real, right? Um, and so I'm really glad to have Darcy there. Tiffany, you're up next. Um, Tiffany Hitz, uh, Director Bands and Department Chair at Rachel Carson Middle School in Fairfax, Virginia. Fun fact, Tiffany is the only person on this panel that was at my wedding. Just throwing that out there for everybody. Um, in addition to her work at uh, Carson, uh, Rachel is all Rachel. Tiffany is also um, on the board of directors for the NBA as a middle as a middle school rep, correct? Middle school representative, um, and she does uh, like everybody. She does tons of honor bands and lots of great clinics. She's done a lot of great, powerful clinics with RS Golden, who's at Michigan State, um, and so really excited to have uh, Tiffany. And then Alicia. 
uh alicia is here so alicia is assistant director of vans at lewisville high school and prior again uh she was at shadow ridge um which is in flower mound texas um alicia is also the chief editor for musical mastery which is an instrument specific uh beginner curriculum that she wrote with um some really cool people um of course chris meredith is one of them that who is here um also Burke is here uh it was on that Kathy Johnson and Dominic Talanka was also on that so I think I got all of those people as well so in general um uh lots of experience here right and so I want to just kind of turn it over um we had some questions already from the very very beginning uh before we even got into this that people had about so I'm going to just kind of throw this out there to people in general, and we'll go around and if people have certain things that they want to say, pop right on in and I'll just kind of moderate this as we go. Um, so the first question had to do with not only accessible warm ups for middle school, but just kind of what you all do your process for warming up uh, an ensemble and of course. We have two levels here that I think we can talk about. We have sort of like the the middle school. What what, what would, do we typically do for a middle school? Because I think when I hear middle school bands, very often I hear uh, maybe a Remington concert F, sometimes just forever without breathing. And then I hear um, a, a concert B flat scale and a round, right? And then we're off and we take a tuning note. Um, and I know a lot of you have a very different approach to that. So I don't know if anybody wants to jump in in terms of just kind of your procedure for warming up. I don't know if um, one of you actually even did a, a thing on the warm ups uh, about kind of preparing that, but I would I would love to have somebody jump in. And if not, I'll call on you. Um, I'll start. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, we're super excited to be doing this uh, with you guys and for you guys. Um, I think for me, uh, when it comes to the warm up, I'm just going to say that it kind of depends on the time of the year that we're in. Um, at the beginning of the year, uh, let's say I have a 48 minute class period and 25 minutes of my class period is probably developed or, or is built around, you know, warm ups in the fall. Um, as we are getting the kids transitioning, you know, as I always say, sixth graders transitioning into big kid band. Um, and then our upper kids, you know, seventh graders who are now eighth graders, um, just transitioning them into what it's like to be in band and what it's like to play inside of an ensemble, especially after you've left a beginner class where you've been um, playing individually um, a lot. Um, and then we also do develop technique development throughout that. So you have your full ensemble warmups, you know, starting with like Concert F, we do Remingtons, you know, up and down. Um, and then of course, you know, flow studies, that leads us into scales and then technique development within those scales. Of course, as I get into the spring and get into um, what we call UIL here in Texas, and we're getting prepared for that, um, it can be as quick as concert F and articulation exercise, and then we're diving into the music. Um, I do believe in doing articulation exercise every single day, and I do it on the first day we play, and I do it on the very last day we play, um, because I think it is that important. Um, so that's kind of how I um, develop the warm up um, exercises for the students that I teach on a daily basis. Anybody have anything to, to kind of follow up on that with? Yep, and I'll tag on there. I think that um, it is really easy to have a handful of workhorse um, fundamentals that you do with your kids that you can change um, to fit whatever you're doing at that point in time. Um, I mean, Remingtons, you're going to hear in our band hall almost every day. Um, you know, eight count concert F stuff, but that changes in so many ways. I mean, um, talking about doing articulation every day, you know, with our, especially with like our second and our third bands, a lot of times those articulation exercises start built into uh, a Remington. So whereas we might just be playing F, E, F, then we change it to F, F, E, E, F, and then bringing it into eighth notes and then bringing it into, um, you know, four eighth notes and four eighth notes and four eighth notes, and then, at, you know, speeding that up so that we're getting the tongue moving faster, keeping it clean. But it doesn't have to be like some revolutionary thing. Like you don't need four billion fundamental books that are going to take you through this stuff. You take your basic eight count concert F, you change it for what you're doing. You take your Remington, you change it for what you're doing. Um, it, it, it's very, very simple. When you have, when you 
notice a problem that your band has, whether it be tuning, whether it be articulation, whether it be balance, you can take those same exact warm ups. And sometimes it's even just telling your kids, okay, today we're going to listen for are you playing the same volume as both of the people on either side of you? It, does your articulation match across the room? Let's hear flutes versus trumpets. Are there is their articulation as clean across the room? You don't have to to reinvent the wheel. You just take those exact same warm ups and and you craft them to fit the skill you are trying to address. I'll just tag off of what Darcy said and say, you know, not only is that really helpful for when you're trying to meet have your warm ups meet. Uh, a piece of music, but it's also really helpful for keeping their brains fresh and making sure that they don't just fall into a rut of here is, you know, the system that we go through and they kind of face off. So I, I do the same thing. I, I like to mix it up. And for no other reason, often it's just to wake them up and make sure that they don't assume that they know what's coming up next. Um, so I can direct that the way I want it to be at the beginning of class. I love all of this. I'm taking a lot of notes. Um, I also like to do a lot of singing um, and ear training in that fundamental time. Um, I think back to uh, prior to the book that Brian and Robert did together, I think back to Brian visiting and uh, and kind of calling us out and saying, you know, great, you guys play a beautiful concert F. How about the other pitches? Um, and so using the harmony director to get inside of those other tones and help students develop a little bit more awareness of their instrument tendencies and what's gonna be different in balancing that way. And singing, I think really helps. Alex, I want you to jump in here because this is like your wheelhouse right here. Yeah, no, and everything that Robert, Darcy, Christine and Tiffany said is like 100% awesomeness. And I would add that any skill that's required in the music needs to be addressed during the fundamental time. Um, that the music should not be the first time they're dealing with tonguing 16th notes or whatever it is. Um, the other thing I'm always asked, how much time do you spend on fundamentals? My answer is always the same, as long as it takes. Um, Robert mentioned that the majority of the time at the beginning of the year is spent on fundamentals and generally that's the way it works for me at the beginning of the year even with my college band the first week all we do is fundamentals it's just about developing learning how to breathe correctly deep breath it takes 80 percent lung capacity to produce an individual resonant tone like an optimum tone so i'm always getting them to try to inhale as much as they can and that in and of itself helps solve a lot of tone issues a lot of us focus on blowing the air faster, which is important and all those things. But um, I found that one of the steps, especially with young kids, is they don't understand how to inhale enough air to be able to play and produce the tone that they need to produce. So I invest like 100% of the time at the beginning. And then as, as the semester goes on, it's less and less and then more uh, into the music. Um, the other thing I think Darcy mentioned doing two things at once and that's great i like take a multivitamin every day because i'd like to knock things out all at once and that's a great thing to do as you're doing like concert f throw in an articulation or rhythm that they have in the music um and then you're taking care of, the, of those things as well so those those are just a couple of things i will i will add one one other thing at the beginning of the school year when you're teaching concepts teach singular focus concepts you don't want to overwhelm the students so if you're focusing on balance focus on balance. If you're focusing on tone, focus on tone, and then gradually you can expand from there. All right, I can go on for two hours, but I'm not going to. Yeah, well, and I'd like to pick up on, on a lot of the things that we're talking about. So um, one of the things that that I know we had heard, and, and it's a legitimate question, is that, you know, again, we're looking at a, a lot of these areas that are in, uh, a lot of these schools that are in very, very highly successful areas where you've got maybe a lot of, of high income students, which I know is actually not the case with several of you. Um, but in particular, I want to kind of uh, look over at Chris and, and Alicia for a moment, because um, you guys are currently at a Title I school. Um, and so a lot of the things you guys have had a lot of success over your careers, um, and you're building this new program up uh, really quite well. But um, you're kind of, again, building some things up from, from the ground up. 
Um, and so I think one of the questions is, you know, again, how how are you incorporating all of this in into um, that kind of environment, especially in one where these kids are probably not all taking private lessons? You know, how do you hold them accountable? Um, and and that kind of segues into another question, which once you guys get into it, I'd like to hear from some of the rest of you, which is um, what are your expectations for the kids when they're not in school, right? And especially for those who do not have uh, private lessons. All right, I guess I'll I'll kind of jump in, Alicia, first on all of it. Real quick, just to talk about the ensemble warm-ups and all of that. Um, for my perspective on this, it, it I think it really starts in your beginner year as far, you know, Robert talked about 25 minutes out of a 45 minute class period, um, really going into fundamentals a lot. Well, how do you condition kids to do that? Well, it has to be like the first thing they they're used to in their first year. So like in, in the, in the first year when they're in beginner classes, um, our, we, we structure classes in a very similar way. You know, most of our time is not spent uh, playing songs in beginner class. We're, 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 we're deeply in fundamental drills. Um, and, and what you just talked about, Brian, you know, how do we do this in an environment where you don't know um, what the kid's going home to, but they're going to have a space to really uh, practice in and all of that. I, I try to think of myself as a personal trainer for the kids. Uh, so in the worst case scenario, you know, whatever time they're in front of me is the only time they're going to play. I know that that's not going to be the case, but try to have the mentality of, this session that I have in front of them, whether it's in a large ensemble or, or a smaller beginner class a sectional or whatever, uh, we have to like get through a, a, a bunch of a bunch of material um, or at least a lot of exercises that hit a lot of things. I really loved what Tiffany said a moment ago. I just wanted to hit on it. Just the ear training as part of the, the warm up process, right? We're, we're really, really teaching the ears if we're, if we're doing anything as, as musicians, as we're building them up. Um, I know there's a lot of different places and Alicia, I'll let you chime in here in a, in a second, but, you know, just trying to hear individuals every single day um, in whatever capacity that is, um, you know, what, whether that's, you know, just down the row and on F concert or whatever pitch F sharp, you know, B flat, B natural um, to hit all those things and just getting that, that quick feedback, whether it's in a small group or, or a large group, but when we don't have lessons, uh, the biggest thing, uh, Alicia and I talked about this quite a bit because we came from at Shatteridge, a program where uh, lessons were um, uh, abundant, uh, especially in our top ensemble. And now we're in a, in a situation where um, that it's not that that's not the case um, at all. The the biggest thing I miss about having those lessons for the kids is is really the extra adult one-on-one -on -one conversation that's happening and and that that mentorship that happens there too um so it's can kind of combat that alicia and i try to listen to our kids uh once every three to, to four weeks um and outside the school sort of situation or during their block lunch situation so we have that moment where they have that individual uh adult mentorship you know, um, a lot of times private lessons can turn into just a very guided practice session. Um, but the key thing is having that, uh, that adult conversation with, with the child about where they're going with their musical journey and like where they are and those sorts of things. Uh, that's just the biggest thing, Alicia. Yeah, so um, another thing with the personal trainer that, and I've always been, um, rehearsing like the non-varsity students and so I'm like all right these are the kids that are not in the top band what am I doing to get them into the top band in the future um one of the biggest things is I feel like it's my job to make sure that I'm expanding their range on their instruments on a daily basis and so something where the brass players in like a seventh grade level um will do like a e-flat ascending pattern with some ear training and drones and I'm like if I can make sure these kids can get up to an e-flat every day and then eventually maybe we can get up to a concert F two octave range every day. I feel like it's my job in the fundamental time to kind of incorporate that uh, to the extent now with my high school non varsity band kids, you know, we're past a concert E flat for them, but it's like, all right, I'm looking at their UIL music. I need my first trumpets up on a concert A flat or a concert B flat. 
what can I do starting in November, December and map it out over four months to make sure that by the time we hit April, like the concert A flat is not the highest note that they play every day. Like they're playing above that so that, that feels really comfortable. And then, so even things with woodwinds would be like, all right, woodwinds, you're all gonna take everything up an octave, brass, you stay where you are, or you're just gonna take it down an octave. And so making sure it's my job that they play every note on their instrument every day, and that I am pacing their range building, knowing that they're not in lessons or someone's gonna do the flow studies with them and you know expand it that way. So this is kind of a tag along with, especially the technique side of the ensemble warm up. What can I do with the kids to make sure that they're doing everything they need to? And then they don't like hit the next year and they're like, oops, I never played that note. So I feel like that's on me. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, just to piggyback on what Chris and Alicia said, which again, excellent advice. Um, number one, I tell my future uh, band directors at Vandercook that they need to assume that they're the only private teacher their kids are ever going to have. And honestly, even during my 30 years of teaching high school band in Florida, I never had the majority of my students taking privately. I encouraged it, uh, but I never compelled it just because of finances and actually how I grew up because I didn't have money to take lessons when I was in high school or middle school. Um, the other thing that Alicia was touching on is we need to, uh, the way I rehearse ensembles is like a big private lesson. And so you, you need to, like parents will ask, how should my kid practice at home? And I tell them they should practice exactly how we do things in band. And that's what Alicia was describing. So if we do breathing, we do long tones, we do rhythms a certain way, you use a metronome, whatever it is that you do, we need to practice our ensemble so our students know how to practice. And there's no question, just do exactly what we do. Go ahead, Christine. I was just going to say to take off of what Alex was saying, I think sometimes we have to take it a step further and um, list out for the students and the parents what those steps are. So maybe that's um, at the beginning of each of my Canvas modules, it says what to practice this week. And then I list out all of the things that I want them to do in their daily practice at home or I've seen a lot of uh, great Texas band directors who organize their folders with dividers so that their warm-ups are in this section and their uh, technique is in this section and their, their concert pieces are in this section. And then, so I just think, uh, especially in the educational uh, situation that we have, we have to really inform parents and make it so easy for students and parents to have a list to follow um, whether or not they do it is another thing, but I think it, it really helps to have things organized that way. I want so, to tag on with what Christine good. just said about getting the parents involved with knowing what they should hear at home. One of the things that we do um, a few weeks into the school year, like, and this is probably jumping the gun, Brian, so I apologize, but um, like one of the things that our kids are required to do is have practice sheets and yes, it records time, but mostly it's giving them like a recipe of what their practice session should look like when they get home. And they have, I, I tell them what fundamentals in what order I want them to practice everything that night. When it gets to the songs, that the songs should be the last thing you do because you have to do those fundamentals first. They go out and they list, okay, if I have a brand new song, if I was assigned line 18, how do I attack line 18? I should be doing, I should count it first. I should go back and sing it on top next. I should go back and sing it on note names. Oh, wait, that was bad. Let's do the note names again. Like we go and we list all of this stuff out. But then on the flip side of that, after we do assignment sheets for a couple of weeks, I find my favorite one for like maybe the third one we do. And I take a picture of it and I scribble out the kid's name and I scribble out the parent signature and I send it to every beginner. And I say, this is what a perfect practice sheet looks like. Are you seeing this? Are you hearing these things? Did you ever hear your kids sing note names at home? If you haven't, they aren't following the prescription for how they practice at home. And that's when you get the emails from the parents that are like, oh my gosh, my, parent, my kid is about to get really good because I haven't heard any of that, but we will from now on. Um, but you, you kind of let the kids and the parents feel out how this is going to work. And then you make sure that they really under, understand um, from that point on. 
I don't think it's as effective to explain all of that at the beginning. There's just so much information that beginner parents get at the very beginning and putting all of that on the parents at the very, at, at the very start um, is a little overwhelming with details, but when you present it to the kids um, and the families a little bit into the year where they're not they don't have a, they haven't had a chance to dig themselves into a hole yet. Um, if you want to call it that, but the parents now understand what the heck you're talking about. Those practice sheets made no sense when I was talking about them in August, but now they get it now that we're a couple of weeks into the school year. So getting the parents on your side of, as what they should be hearing now. So and I, I love that. Go ahead, Tiffany. Sorry. I just think tagging onto what Darcy said, I think it's so great about like too much information at one time. Um, and so in the beginning of the year, when parents are asking me, you know, how long should my student practice? And um, I, I, I do practice records a little bit differently, where it's just like, I want them to set goals, and that's what they're working for. But in the beginning, before we discuss all of that and talk about how to set a goal and figure out if it's rigorous enough, um, I talk to them about just practicing what we do in class, you know, reviewing that, especially for the younger kids. And that idea of like practicing, like brushing your teeth and a little bit every day is a lot better than a lot at one time. And the parents have responded and said that that's really helpful because now it kind of takes the pressure off of, well, what if I don't have 30 minutes today? Or what if I don't have 20 minutes today? At the very beginning, they just get them practicing and playing. And then, like you guys have said, when they're ready for more information, I can start rolling out a little bit more specifics about it. I love that. Um, you know, every has touched on this and, and, and actually we've gotten almost three different people that have uh, one in the session and then two prior that are asking the similar question. I was going to save this till later, but everything that we're saying is kind of taking us in this direction. So I'm going to just throw it out there. Um, the one thing I know about all of you um, is that any any time I've ever had an interaction with you and your ensembles, it's an incredible environment, right? It's just a very positive environment. Um, it's a very, just a nurturing, but it's also just, um, I, I, I guess really, it's just positive. That's the best way I can put it. Kids are excited. They're happy. And the, the question we keep getting, right, how do you foster uh a positive environment, especially right now, when so many people are telling me my my band just kind of seems like, you know, person that I talked to today said, you know, hey, the first step was just to get them to be able to kind of play again. But now we're still in this kind of like flat phase of personality where it just hasn't come back yet. Um, and I think a lot of people are asking, you know, how do you balance fundamentals with giving them for lack of a better word, a, a musical experience and creating a, an environment that these kids are going to be so excited about versus kids being angry that, uh, you know, our band used to be sweepstakes winners or our band used to be a grade five band and now we're a grade three or four band. Like, how do you create that environment to keep them or maintain that environment even and continue to do all this? Go ahead, Christine, and then Robert, you're next because I was going to go to you because you've I, I've seen you beat those kids up scentless, and then they come back the next day and they're like bringing you chocolates and candy, and they love you. So I want to know a little of that herring secret sauce. But Christine, let's hear you first. Well, I I mean I don't know if I have the answer because I think there's a lot of answers, and I just remember when I started at my school, there were um, less than fifty kids in band total, and they were not a strong program. And so one thing that I really took to heart was teach them where they're at. So regardless of where they have been, you've got to find out where they are. And fortunately, there's so much music out there that you can give things that are going to be enriching to the students where they're at. And if you give them things at that level and, and build a program which is going to help them to succeed as they find success, they are going to feel better about themselves. They're going to be feeling better about the environment that they're in. And band will be quote unquote fun because it's successful. And it's successful because you taught them where they were at when they came to you after you came back into teaching school because we're all different. And all of us had our kids at different amounts during COVID. And all of us got to recruit differently. 
And so we're all building it in a different place. But what we have in common is that we're all trying to teach our kids where they're at if we want them to be successful. I am wholeheartedly on board with that. I say that to everyone, meet your kids where they're at and grow them up. Um, you know, I think the the culture in which you create in your band hall starts in the beginner year. And I will say that, you know, um, the atmosphere that we create here is that mistakes are celebrated. And I think in other places, like in math class, when it's wrong, it's wrong, and this is wrong and wrong and wrong. And in here, we celebrate the mistake. And it's like we cheer and it's like, oh my gosh. And then we talk about why that mistake happened. And here's what we can do to get better from that. And then we're like, thank you so much for cracking that note, or thank you for pushing down the wrong button, or thank you, you know, that way the kids feel really comfortable and confident in your classroom where they want to come back every single day because they know that it's okay to not be perfect, especially in that beginner year. Then when you transition them into your, um, your, performing bands, you know, I think one of the big things that we do is, we, you mentioned the fundamental piece. Well, I make fundamentals fun. And the joke here is like, fundamentals should be fun. And uh, duh, everyone should do them. And if you don't, you're mental, right? And so all the kids laugh. And it's, you know, it's just a, a really fun experience. And I turn everything that we do fundamentally into a game. Because let's be real, we're teaching kids. And these, and and they always want something. If I do something, what do I get? That's just the, the generation we teach, you know? That being said, there is always, they will do anything for stickers and pizza, right? So um, I always try to create as many um, reward systems as I can. They also know that I have really high expectations. And my expectations don't always come from music. It comes from being a good person, being a good human, being kind to each other, taking care of your responsibilities at home and in your classes. And I think by me not putting so much emphasis on the music, but about being a good person and being a good human and just being good, you know, at everything that you do, I think that is why they work so hard for us. And when they do something really well, everyone knows that I'm a, the prop person, right? Like I will pull out pom poms or put on a wig or do a cartwheel or whatever the case may be, you know, to celebrate that because they are looking for that kind. That's what they want to see when it comes to me. But really, you know, it does start in the sixth grade year. But if you can celebrate, it should be a place where they know when they walk in your room, it is okay to be who they are. And if I'm going to make a mistake, mistake, I'm going to make a confident mistake because you know what? The more confident confidence you play with and the more confident mistakes you make at the beginning, you're not going to make them in the very end. And so we always talk about like that we this is where we are. We practice in here. We get it all out in this room so that when we get to a major performance or, you know, a concert or whatever, it, it just happens, right? We revert back to what's comfortable and what's comfortable is in the band hall and they know um, how to just, you know, get on the stage and perform. We also do a lot of performing, performances in the classroom too. I'm very big on hearing kids a lot individually all the time and they know that anyone, I'll call it the wheel of death, right? Um, we spin it all the time, you know, and you have to play something and everybody's always, you know, and they kind of like want to do it now because it's so, I mean, the kids just cheer and we always do foot applause of encouragement before anybody plays. Like, Give foot applause of encouragement to get it to boost them all up and then like the beginner classes are so cute even in this in your upper bands like they just cheer each other on and it's really awesome to see that but they don't get that in math class they don't get that in science or language arts and history you know they can get it in athletics but it's different you know in our our room i think it's it's really special but i truly believe that the the successes that all of the band directors on this screen have, it starts in the beginner year because we help those kids right from the beginning. And it's like Darcy was saying, not giving parents too much information. The first thing, the first information they get from me is what is a band chair? And it's just me in my house. And I've recorded myself going like, here is what a band chair looks like. A band chair is not your normal recliner, you know? And like, and it's just a fun video and we laugh about it. And then the next one they get is like, your kid is about to start playing their instrument. You're gonna hear some very interesting sounds. Please do not say that even if you think they sound bad, please do not tell them that they sound bad. You encourage them to continue to keep practicing and doing the things. And then the next one is like, uh-oh, they're gonna play their first note. And it's like three little bullet points in the email, like remind them to be sure they take a deep, full breath, set their armature before they begin. And if we're tonguing, start with their tongue. Good luck, have fun, you know? And that way the parents buy and they love it because now they feel like they can help their child when they're at home. So then now the, the parent thinks that you're the best person on the planet because you've reached out to them and there's that open communication, but it's little bitty small pieces of information that they're getting um, over a period of time. I think something that you would find with all of us is um, you it, it's really easy to point out mistakes, but if we're honest, we never need to point them out because everybody can hear them. Um, 
finding ways to get kids to desire praise for good things instead. And sometimes that means that you discover that different kids are stronger at different things and being able to use them as models for those type of things. I bet we can all think of some kid that is better at counting than a kid that plays really well or a kid that can note name way faster than everybody else. We played mess up dropout in my trombone class today. The kid that went, wins mess up dropout almost every day is not the kid that is ever going to get first chair for me. But that kid can count his little booty off. And so I'm going to use him as an example anytime I can. And that's something that he can feel good about. And when he feels good about that, he is going to look for other ways in my class to be recognized because praise is addicting. I mean, it, it truly is. And I think that's what you would find um, with a lot of us is finding ways that we can tell the kids that they are doing a great job. They may not be able to string together all of the great things, um, but if, if I can point out a way that a kid is being awesome, um, that is going to come back to me in other ways um, with them looking for that praise and recognition. And I, I don't know, it just snowballs. And I just want, I'm sorry, Alex, I just want to say one thing. I'm very passionate about this. Do not give up on the end of your, the bottom of classes that do, that is what it makes your program special. You teach every single kid, whether they're first chair or last chair, and you last year may never get it for the longest time, but they will eventually get it. You cannot give up on kids. And again, that is why they keep coming back to our classes because they feel the love and they, and they know that they're, that they're wanted there and that we teach them. Well, on that, Robert, I probably worked way harder with my third band than I did with my top band because you have to invest that time because eventually they're going to be in your top band. Um, the other thing, Christine touched on this, success is a motivator. And so you do have to meet your kids where they are. And that's the power of music. When they do something, produce a great sound, ring a chord, play a phrase, whatever it is, it motivates them when they do it well. And you have to hold them to a high standard. And the other thing that you hear echoed a lot is you need to inch along. When I taught middle school my first six years, I used to like ask the guy across town, hey, what number in the Red Book are you on? I'm on 37. I'm on 86. Oh, I got to go faster. Wrong answer. It's important that quality is job one. And eventually they'll be able to go faster. You know, we're, we're so worried about we have to learn this piece. It's not about learning the piece. It's about getting them to be great musicians, get great players, and then they'll be able to play those pieces. But you have to develop the musician, the player, and that needs to be the focus. And if it's important to you, it's going to be important to them. I love that. And, and, and on this whole topic of, of reading and, and getting them all, um, you know, just reading really well and getting them to sound good, um, Chris and Alicia, you, you had written this great article on music literacy right and and all of these things that you do with the kids just to get them to be able to read quickly and and, and a little bit of that system um and and just a couple of people had asked uh you know you you kind of outlined all of these things that you do whether it's like um the way you have them say the names and then the way they they um or to, it's a whole thing that you had done and and just just a little bit of, of the way you get kids started on that specifically. Um, and again, this kind of thing of okay, if I'd only see my kids twice a week, are you do these kids take it home with them? How do you kind of do something like that where they can maintain, keep learning despite the fact of not seeing them every day? So I'll, I'll hand that off to the two of you guys. I'll go first. <laughs> uh, so. What Brian's referencing right now is what we're doing with um, our bottom band at the high school, but it's exactly what we are also pacing with all of our beginners, um, knowing that at the high school level, our high school fourth band is our farm system for eventually our high school top band. Um, and so we have a curriculum with them that's going to look pretty different than your normal like let's sit down, start with fundamentals and play some music uh, for a contest where these students come into the fourth band. Um, they'll have a note name sheet on their chair. They'll fill that out real quick. They'll turn that in. Um, I will grade that immediately as they then transition to like a rhythm system where they're going to start uh, passing off some lines of their rhythms. Um, and it's all individually paced. So every kid is on whatever rhythm line they have gotten to next. Um, every kid is on whatever note name sheet they have gotten to next. And 
two things happen there. The first thing that happens is the students will only get a 100. Um, so if they miss something on the note name sheet, I just show them what it is and they'll do it again the next day. Um, and then on their rhythms, either they get 100 on it or they'll try again later and they'll get 100 on it. So in our class, I tell them, you're going to come in and you're going to get a 100 in this class, not because I'm going to give you 100, but because I'm going to give you the opportunity to just keep trying and trying and trying until you fully master it. Because I was like, when we do get to a concert, I can't have 90% of the notes played correctly. We need to have 100% played correctly. Um, and so it also gives us a chance to be speaking to kids individually. We're passing them off individually. So we're building that connection with the kid. Every kid we get to talk to one-on-one -on -one at the beginning of class. And I imagine a lot of their other classes, they don't get the opportunity to teach the, talk to their teacher one-on-one. -on -one. You know, they turn in their math homework and the only thing the teacher says is, you're missing your math homework. You know, that's the only time the teacher would come talk to a kid is if they're missing something or they're failing something. But this is the flip side where we get to interact with them every day. And then by building those literacy skills as like the main portion of our class, they then have the reading ability to go home and play songs on their own. Um, and then, you know, we show them how to go through a whole rhythm structure and note naming structure when we're learning music that they can take that same system and they can teach themselves things at home. So we kind of, with those students especially, um, the percentage of class spent on literacy skills is way higher so that they can eventually move up into a higher band and then you know they have the skills to read the music to to advance further so and um i mean the kids in that class i'd say maybe one student is taking private lessons i mean so we're, we're the ones giving them um everything and it's been really cool um in the third year of it with these high school kids to see, I mean, we have a girl now in Wind Symphony in the top band who went through that fourth band system and kind of worked her way up over the last two years. And um, even kind of funny relationship going into marching band is we've been able to work on the individual rhythm reading with each kid and their individual pulse that now you throw those kids outside and they have like a little bit more of a internal pulse in their feet when they're they're thrown out there too. So. I think that answered where we were on the question. <laughs> Did you get it, Chris? It, She's she, pretty she, good. Yeah. I mean, I will she, say I, she knows. <laughs> yes, and just to go back just for just a moment. Um, and I think what everyone kind of also touched on too is when you're talking about a positive environment for your program that you want, it's all about relationships, right? And, and that's why it has to start in your beginner class. Um, you know, where th those, those first moments there with, with the students and also with the parents and parent expectations, like what Robert's describing there, it takes a little bit of effort to, to remember to make a video like that. Um, but once you have it um, on one year, I mean, it's rinse and repeat, uh, you know, like, and, it's, and that's a beautiful thing too. Um, so uh, one quick example, um, transitioning, uh, during COVID uh, to a high school position here, one of uh, the leadership team, the student leadership team, uh, blamed COVID basically on me uh, because I literally walked in uh, as, as COVID was happening. So they were pretty upset. But one of the things they, they, they had a sit down meeting with me just to address all the things they're really upset with uh, me and to, to try to create this more positive environment. One of the things that they talked about was you're too nice. They, they literally said, um, you sugarcoat too much. You're too nice. If you want us to count on the marching field as we're doing like marching fundamentals, you have to yell at us. And I fundamentally believe that you should not have to yell at a, a, a kid to, to, to do something. Uh, I, I, if you do, there's something fundamentally wrong uh, with the entire situation. Um, and now, you know, a few years later, we don't have to yell at them to to count on the field you know uh, what what did we do what was the real issue there well the real issue is uh counting wasn't going on in their head when they were moving around the field so there's nothing to count because you know there was nothing going on there so we taught them you know our middle school teachers are awesome but like you know they can lose a lot of information as they go up to the high school we had to reinforce and teach them okay this is how you count and clap in our in our in our system you know this is how you uh read rhythms groupings of rhythms this is how you approach all of this then voila you know 
when we're outside now, like what is going on in their head? Subdivisions are going on in their head, you know? So counting becomes like really, really natural. Um, sorry to go off on a tangent there, but literacy is, is the key to everything. Um, and being able to have some touch points, like what Alicia said, we, we, we sit down with our, our young kids and we try to do it at one line a day where we just go down the line uh, really quickly individually and have them demonstrate and perform for us uh, a rhythm line. And we can have a moment where they're getting individual instruction immediately, some feedback, encouragement, and all of that, that builds a relationship that highlights uh, what they need to be doing and how they read and all of those sorts of things, which is going to save time later, even though it seems like it's going to take up a lot of time at first. You know, one interesting thing about the whole down the line thing. So obviously I'm the only one here who's not a band director, but I've been in many band rooms where they've done that. And uh, um, um, Tiffany, I have a good a friend in common, uh, Brad Zimmerman. And and I remember I was in his, uh, and a great teacher, and I was in his elementary band uh, one time and he was going down the line. He was like, something didn't sound right. And he's like, flutes, let me hear it. And they went right down the line. And without even thinking, every flute player just picked up their instrument and they just played, right? And I remember asking him afterward, I was like, how did you do that? And he's, what do you mean? I was like, like, they weren't scared at all. They just did it. And he goes, well, I never told them they should be scared. Like since day one, we just do it. And it's, they know that I'm not attacking them. They know that it's not like trying to catch them. We hear a mistake and, and going back to what Robert said, right? Make a joyful mistake. Like, oh, that's what it was. Make sure you're putting down two and three or whatever it is, not one and two and moving on but i think a lot of us can learn from that that it, it's that culture and if you just get them used to it like oh hey flukes, let me just go down real quick let me see if we can find it Where, where's the intonation problem where's this then it's solved and it also makes them a lot more confident in performance too so i love that down the line you hear that a lot and you start that on easy stuff in the very beginning it's just a whole note down the row or counting one measure. You start them really easy and then they never know it's anything. It's always something they do. It's a part of band. Let that dog out. But you do all you do all of the easy stuff and it just builds confidence. And then you can do the hard stuff down the road too. Yeah, bingo. And Robert said it, the most important year in any musician's life is year one. You You set all that up right at the beginning. So a question that comes in here about year one, right? And not only year one, but really at any, any, especially a younger musician. Um, one of the questions is, what is your approach to explaining dynamics? And not only the approach to explaining them, but teaching them, right? Because um, I think the, the one person that I've spoken to um, that was outside of this, but they said, you know, I try to get my kids to play soft and they don't sound good. And and so then I don't want them to play soft, but then what, what, so how do you guys start to ingrain that into your kids to be able to actually get them to play soft, but do it well. And then how do you explore playing loud without this big bombastic sound? Because I will say one thing, let, let's just get it out there, right? A lot of, a lot of middle school programs get criticized because their bands always just sound like band. Right? No matter what the dynamic is, everything sounds like band. And and you get the criticism that the, the trumpets never sound bright because we're trying to make everything blend all the time. But yet trumpets should sound bright at times. Like there should be moments where the trumpets sound bright and beautiful. Um, and and everything always just kind of sounds band, right? So so each one of you, your bands have a characteristic sound. And and how do you how do you create that? I'm going to throw something in before my colleagues answer, but I always tell my students, especially when they play soft, always take a fortissimo breath. You have to compress the air in order for soft to sound good. I'll let them elaborate. I'll, so we do not teach dynamics until the kids are making characteristic sounds. We, we wait, and sometimes it's a long can you, time. Can you say that twice? Yes. We do not teach dynamics until the kids can make a characteristic sound because let's be real, playing loud and playing soft is really hard. So why would I ask them to do either of those things until they can play just a nice mezzo forte with a good sound? And sometimes that means that I wait painfully long in the year. Just because a dynamic was written in your beginner book does not mean that you are required to teach it. 
In fact, a lot of times the kids will be, what are those Fs underneath there? Shush, I don't want to know about them. I definitely don't know, want to know what that P was underneath there. We're going to completely ignore it, and I will teach it in April, sometimes May. I will wait until, I'm, especially with clarinets, clarinets don't learn dynamics for a long time for me. Um, my, my brass will learn it quicker than my, than my woodwinds probably, but we wait for a really long time. And the other thing you have to tag on to what Brian said, one of the things that I will say very often to my kids is if you want to get good at playing basketball, you have to play basketball. If you want to get good at running, you have to go run. And if you want to get good at playing soft, you have to do that. That means building it into your fundamentals, like in your seventh and eighth grade bands and your performing bands. Sometimes they should play Remington's piano. Sometimes they should play them double F. Sometimes they should put crescendos and decrescendos in there. And your beginners have to do that kind of stuff too. When you are initially teaching those things, um, like when I'm finally teaching trombones how to play forte, like we have to play a lot of forte that they need practice on that just like they need practice on anything. I love it. So if, if, it's, if it's April, that's fine. Your band sounds great. And maybe they sound great at, at mezzo piano and mezzo forte, and you build from there. But but I I, I agree. So many times people just tr just throw it out there, and they they uh, they don't play with a good sound. And so I, I absolutely love that. Um, anybody else have any thoughts on this before we move on? Um, potentially to the last question because of time, but it's a question for all of you anyway. So any other thoughts on dynamics or? Go ahead, Tiffany. I'll just add that um, I kind of approach it the same way I approach like brass buzzing that, you know, when they're buzzing a siren, like at first it might be small and then they develop that skill and they develop that range. And so I like to think about that the same way with dynamics as well, so that we always are maintaining that characteristic sound that, you know, we start with small changes and, you know, they're when we start introducing it, their forte to piano might be here because this has to sound really good and this has to sound really good. And like Darcy said, the more they do it, the more they build that skill. And so then they're able to expand it. And I use um, an analogy a lot about like dimmer switches on lights, you know, like here, here's, here's soft, here's loud. And like, here are all the different colors of light in the middle. So here, here's, um, this is actually a great question and, and I'll ask each one of you to, to answer this. Um, but the, the question is, how are you approaching programming right now, right? Um, in other words, I think for a lot of folks around the world, even for a lot of us, this is like the first quote unquote normal start to a year that we've had in two plus years, some people three, right? Um, and so I think one of the questions, you know, and it's interesting because because Darcy, I could talk about you in last year where you're preparing again for Midwest with with a Zoom band where I think 50 percent of your it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe 50 percent of your band that played at Midwest last year started on Zoom. Exactly 50 percent. Yeah. Yep. And so and stayed on Zoom their entire beginner year. Yeah. And so that that alone, um, we'll come back and, and do a session on Zoom band, which hopefully nobody will attend because we're done with it. But anyway, um, so the question is for each of you, um, how are you approaching programming right now? Maybe maybe even uh, share with us a, a couple of things that you are programming and and maybe even as it relates to previous years, right? Like, hey, I'm not programming as hard or I've gotten my program back. We are programming this hard. Um, and, and I'd love to hear some information, not only about your top bands, but but maybe your second bands or your third bands or whatever, and just get a little bit of information. And so if you want, um, maybe we'll go in reverse order that I introduced you all in, if I can do that, which means that Alicia, I would, I would start with you. All right, uh, well, I'll speak to um the the second band and the fourth band at our high school level um something that i did this past spring was actually one of brian's pieces called metamorphic dances um and it's a four movement work um and what worked out great is that kind of knowing okay we can definitely manage for sure this movement maybe another movement and so i picked something where 
we could start where we were and then we could just add movements, but knowing that on the Texas PML that I could enter a contest doing only two or three of the four movements and then I could add movements as I felt the kids were ready. Um, and that's exactly what we did. We ended up competing um, with three movements and then I added the fourth movement for the spring contest or the spring concert. So I was able to kind of add on. So that's something where a multi-movement work can work out really well where you know, one movement can be a song in itself, and then uh, you can keep adding as the students are, are building their skill levels. Um, with our with our fourth band students, um, they honestly, they only know what we give them, and so they don't know what a fourth band is supposed to be playing, and so from them, uh, we'll start the winter concert with um, grade one to one and a half, and we'll get them up to a two and a half or a three as we get into the spring concert, um, but I think for them picking something that's on the shorter side of the time frame, um, you know, that doesn't have as many measures, um, where uh, you're picking something, okay, it has a slow tempo and then it transitions to a fast tempo, um, where I can kind of teach a lyrical element within the piece itself, and maybe they're not mature enough for a full lyrical type piece, something like that. So. Um, kind of considering those options with with the younger students, especially where I can teach an element of something that I'd like them to do, but it's maybe not a full piece worth of that concept. So that's Perfect. where we are for that. So um, Tiffany, you're up next. Which piece of mine are you program? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Um, no, tell us a little bit about what you're programming and, and again, how, what you're even thinking about as you're programming, because you wrote this amazing thing about just, just everything about your approach and all of this stuff and um, people can read all that. It's great. It's, it's, it's awesome, actually. Um, but get into a little bit of just what you're thinking about with programming and what you're maybe what you are programming. I want to start a conversation that I hope Robert will pick up. Um, when it comes around to him, because it's something I, pre-pandemic, I was really fortunate to be able to go visit and observe both Darcy and Robert teach. And Robert had some great conversations about literature with me and about um, pacing the literature as the year goes. And I, I feel so grateful, um, well, for everything I learned during that visit, but I feel uh, really grateful that I learned that, or I discovered that thought process pre-pandemic that if I have a grade four band, they might still start the beginning year at a grade one, one and a half, two piece. I used to not do that. This was a new, I mean, everybody's nodding because they knew. I didn't know, and now I know. Um, and so, you know, even my top band, I we're now, you know, we do, we have a concert next week and they're doing grade one and a half pieces of music so that, I can address all of the fundamental things that we've been talking about. The music is supporting that. The music is not expecting more than that. It's allowing them to access uh, note shapes and phrasing and balance and beautiful tones. And oh, by the way, they're getting to do all those things that we're doing in fundamentals, but they're now getting to also do that in a piece of music. So they feel super successful and they just feel super awesome. But it, I'm glad that I was presented with that idea when I was because it's made this transition much better. I'm not really worried about like whatever grades, you know, things are. Um, I've kind of taken that pressure off my shoulders. It's more what music do they need that's gonna support what I need them to learn, what they need developmentally, and then those jumping off points to get them from point A now to point B and then C so that they can keep uh, building that foundation and those skills as the year goes. Perfect. Um, Darcy. 100%, um, your, your year should progress in difficulty. And one of the things to remember is it really doesn't matter um, what year you're on, what ensemble level, level you are. I'm thinking my lights are about to go out. That looks creepy. Let me turn on the lights. Um, hang on just a second. <laughs> That's really cool. I guess Darcy's at school. Maybe it's like motion sensor and she hasn't moved. That's right. Um. What I was saying, it, it doesn't matter what year 
you are pre-pandemic, what level. Your ensemble is brand new at the start of the year. Like they have never played together. That version of your band has never existed before. That combination of humans has never existed. And I think that sometimes when we see like a really, I mean, there, there are definitely years where even on the first day of school, we know that that band is going to be amazing, whatever level it is. But that band has never existed. And you have to teach them to play together. You have to teach your trumpets to play like a section. You have to teach your clarinets to play like a section. You have to teach them what level do I have to play this year to fit into that trumpet section? Like there are so many of those kind of like fundamental ensemble concepts that are more accessible when we program appropriately for our kids. And so the idea of ramping up and starting with something that is very easy and very attainable for your kids, that is also training their ears as to what an acceptable performance is. Like when, when your kids can match note lengths and articulations and all of that kind of stuff on a grade one and a half, now they know what that sounds like. And when you put a two and a half in front of them, their ears already know what clean sounds like. They've already done clean on something that was easy enough to allow them to know what clean sounds like. And so it just, it keeps ramping up. And that time that you spend on the easier pieces at the beginning of the year is not wasted. And that may be a conversation that you have to have with your older kids, especially when you have really successful older kids in that group. Having this conversation with them that the band is new, the ensemble is new. Um, you need to be my leader in showing them that this stuff that seems babyish to you is worthwhile. Um, that's really all I have to add on the programming because exactly what Tiffany said about letting this all snowball is exactly how I feel. And I don't think that you should um, ever feel bad about under programming. What a concept that maybe the concert just comes together easy and they can play the cred out of it. So, Chris, you're going to be up next, but but before that, I just, r real quick, like even like a one title answer or something like that for Darcy and Tiffany, since I didn't get one from you, um, recommend a title, like a grade one and a half title that you really feel lends itself well to a band that might be a grade three or four band by the end of the year. And if you need to come back, well, Chris is going to have one anyway. Tiffany, do you have one right away or do you need a second? I mean, we're we're doing Ancient City of Stone right now, and um, it lends itself really well to the things that I need them to develop. Perfect. Do you want me to skip you, Darcy? I'll skip you. And then if, if you yeah. have it, let me know. Go okay. ahead, Chris. You got the answer and you're up. Oh, yeah, anyway. I got I got a really good answer. And I think I because I think I heard that uh, maybe Robert had done it or we're so closely tied. Everything here. Texas is pretty big, but like we're, we're all pretty closely tied. Haunted Clocks. You wrote that, didn't you, Ryan? I did write that, dude. That for for a, a fall concert piece, um, and if you have your eyes set on a on a grade four or something in the spring, haunted clocks is such a great piece um, because it's so simple. Um, lots of whole notes, lots of half notes. Um, your kids will, you know, if you've trained your kids um, in, in the all district process, whatever individual process you have in, in the fall, uh, they're doing all the all the things. They'll look at the piece from a technical standpoint and might get aggravated with you because like we're, we're better, like, we're better than this piece. I would throw it back on them. You're not doing this dynamic shaping. Uh, you're not stagger breathing. You're not doing all the details. You know, if you're going to want to get to a, a crazy piece like incandation and dance or something like that with your, your middle school band in the, in the spring. And I say that because like the last group, the last group I taught in middle school, we, we did incantation and dance, but we started with haunted clocks um, in our fall concert. And if you want to get to details in a grade four, you have to be able to play all the details in a grade one and commit to it. Uh, so that it becomes second nature, you know, and I remember, I, I think I remember threatening them because they just, they just weren't committed to the grade one. Like, okay, well, I, I guess, I guess I'll find something easier. I'll find a 0.5. And, and, and they knew I wasn't bluffing. Uh, there, there is no such thing as programming too, too, too little, you know, especially in the early part of everything. Um, but that comes to mind, we, like we would rotate haunted clocks with the top band every two or three years um, because it was such a great teaching, a teaching piece. 
uh, very, uh, it was a fun piece for the kids to, to listen to and, and get into. And if you're, if you're familiar with the piece, it starts out with this like uh, flute, um, random cuckoo sounds at the very, very beginning. And then it kind of morphs into stuff. So kids dig it once, once they get into it and it's kind of spooky and everything. Um, but from a high school perspective right now, um, right now, my, my brain is, is, is centered towards um, ensemble and chamber music. Um, and, and how, how are we, what, what Darcy just said with playing as a section, you know, whether you want to go with the brass quintet or woodwind quintet sort of sound, or you want to go initially with flute quartet or flute choir, and you want to develop the trombone choir or what, what have you, um, we have found with the, trying to develop the culture that we want here and, and, and bringing kids um, up to uh, higher levels, we, we're combining some of our bands into a fuller like trombone choir to a fuller flute choir so that the lower band kids are participating with the upper band kids in these, in these larger chamber group settings and they can learn from each other uh, quite a bit. So right now my brain, when I'm thinking about programming, I'm, I'm really thinking about chamber music and how that really helps the larger larger band ensembles too. I love it. Um, Robert, we're going to, you're next. And, and I will mention about Haunted Clocks. I did, uh, Vista Ridge did that for Midwest and um, it's a high school and they're amazing. Um, but I still remember working them for like over an hour on that, on that piece. And we really, we really got into it. It was a lot of fun. So uh, I had completely forgotten about that. That's really awesome. Robert, go ahead. Um, I think that uh, Tiffany and Darcy really, you know, hit it on the head. Um, it really does, you know, um, at the beginning of the year, I'm not worried about how hard of the music is. I I want to meet my kids where they are, and I also know what ensemble skills I want to develop and what um, um, technical things I need to develop with the kids to get them. It's like planning backwards. I kind of have in my mind where I want to be and what piece I would like to play knowing after hearing my band's audition at the end of the year, I'm going to have strong trumpets and strong clarinets and strong, whatever, and weaker this and weaker that. So I try to actually think about, well, here's what I want to play. What am I going to play? That's going to build up to that, but also challenge the kids that are ready to be challenged, but grow the kids that are going, that are, that need the extra growth, right. And not make them feel like that they aren't good enough to be within the ensemble because they're not as good as the other sections in the band. Um, so that's really important important, you know, to me with my third band, you know, I'm very passionate about the third band at the beginning of the year, you know, really, really loving on those kids and growing them. So we, you know, we have all hands on deck in that class all the time, um, but really picking fun music for them, but they don't know, you know, a 0.5 to a third band kid is the best thing on the planet because it sounds cool, right? And they can do it. And they've been, in, if I'm a sixth grader and or a seventh grader, and I've been in a sixth grade class where there's not ability levels because we teach it all, whether it be resource math to double pace math right it's all in one class um and now they're in a band give them something that they can be successful and i think that's really important um give your band something that every kid in the ensemble can be successful on in their ensemble in that first concert um of course you know right now as we're preparing for midwest there's a lot of stuff going on and then and i was you know when you're teaching a grade three and and you know the beginning of the year you want to pull your hair out right um but that's why i'm bald um no <laughs> Uh, but that being said, that's kind of the way we approach um, the music, you know, every single year. I think that's a really um, smart way to achieve the goals that we'd like to achieve at the end. Awesome. Yeah. If you're going to be at Midwest, go hear Robert's group play. They're they're going to be amazing. They're they're wonderful. And they're doing everything from grade half to grade four. So it's it's going to be great. It's going to be great. Alex, you're up. Uh, Vanderco College of Music. We only program music by Brian Ball Mages. That's all we play here. So okay, you're done. That's good. Let's that's, move that's on. All I no. Have. <laughs> no, no. All the advice has been fantastic. I would just add. Well, we're fortunate here because we premiere a lot of music, so a lot of our stuff is 2022. But one thing I always strive for in every program is variety. You know, throw in a march, throw in a lyrical piece, a dance, three four. So give as much variety to your kids as possible and to your audience. And then the other thing, and Robert touched on this, is include a piece that helps develop an ensemble weakness and include a piece that features an ensemble strength. So I love I know that. I'm short on time, so that's pretty much all I have. That's fine. Christine, bring it home.
Okay, try it again. I was going to say ditto, ditto, ditto to what everyone said. Um, I loved all of those things. One thing that's a little different um, at my school is that I have a lot of students that move in and out through the year. So I might audition my band in the spring and be missing a lot of really key players when everyone shows back up in the fall. Um, it's just very transient that way. And so I really have to think with a lot of options in mind. And when I when I give them those first few songs, definitely they're on the easier end. But um, what might have been my strengths when we left might be some weaknesses if I lost some key players. So I have to keep flexibility in my mind and, and have a number of things ready to go. Uh, when I really like what Alex said, um, I'm a big proponent of, of balance in our repertoire and in our concerts. And maybe because when I was in college, my mom really didn't like coming to my concerts. She's like, I, there's nothing I, nothing I like to listen to. It's all, you know, whatever. And I love playing the music because it was really challenging for me. But if we want to continue to propagate band in our communities and get people wanting to play, we've got to feed a little bit of, of what does the audience want to hear as well as what we want our students to learn. Um, and then something that Heath has always said, Heath Wolf, my husband, um, leave your audience wanting more, not wishing for less. So when you're programming, you know, think of, you know, well, it's just what I said. Leave them wanting more, not wishing for less. And a piece that I love right now, and it just so happens to be by Brian, is uh, Fanfare and Fireworks. Uh, my eighth grade group is playing it and they are loving it. They sound, you know, I think they sound great, but it's because it was written to help them to sound great. And that's what we were talking about, giving them something that they can be successful in, something that they can find joy in and that's going to motivate them to want to work to that next level. I swear to everybody, I did not ask them to pick a piece by me, right? I, 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 and the only one who didn't was the one who was at my wedding. So I don't know. I don't know how this is, is going, right? Um, I, the last thing that I'm going to add as we wrap up is um, one of the things that I have really taken to heart with programming. And of course, again, I, I, I'm doing honor bands, right? I, I'm doing all these things. But for me, one of the things that I'm always really thinking about is, is a piece of music that, um, especially right now, kids can really emotionally latch on to um we know that there are kids out there that are that are hurting a lot right now and they might be um dealing with a, a lot of frustration and, and a piece that just kind of acknowledges that right i know randall standridge has a lot of his um uh, his unbroken um uh series of pieces that he's done for people like that you're not alone and um and different things like that so um that's certainly uh an option you're seeing a lot of pieces that are addressing um very simple things like joy right i mean if you want to hey look you want to come here and feel joy let's play a piece that's about pure joy and and let's play the way you want to feel right or or um with with darcy right last year when she played at midwest i wrote a piece called unknown right it was actually originally called into the unknown until um until frozen 2 came out and that screwed it all up right um but but unknown was all it was like a big you know middle finger to COVID, and and because that's what she went through and and but the kids latched onto it so because they felt like this is about me like this is about my life and and it just it, that's one way that they got really fired up um because they felt like it was something that they could actually identify with and so i think at, with all of us it, picking music that not only technically is, is meeting our kids where they are and getting us to a certain point but also keep in mind that that kids are um, they're all over the place right now, right? Some kids are extremely fragile. Some kids are just extremely like not affected at all. And they were in their happy place during COVID. They're in their happy place now. They're just always happy. And 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 just finding music that that'll cater to all of them. And and so that's just one last thing that I wanted to add. Um I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh I want to thank all of our wonderful clinicians and friends of mine. Um uh, I, I chose really wisely. They always say, surround yourself with people that are better than you. And I've crushed it. I really have. Um, and so I appreciate all of you taking the, the time to be here. 
Um, and so certainly to the folks that make music and the folks uh, not only make music, but but specifically smart music and also behind the scenes, Alfred, I want to thank all of them for helping to facilitate all of this, not only the session, but the entire blog series that is actually still coming out. Um, and so if, if you don't know it, go check it out on, on the smart music, either on social media or on their blog site. Lots of great information that is there for you as well. And other than that, I think we are good. Felicia, I'll pass it back to you if there's anything to pass back. Thanks, Brian. And thank you everyone for coming and for sticking around a little bit long. This was excellent. Lots of great ideas, lots of suggestions here. So to all of our panelists, thank you so much for your time. We know how busy you are and we really appreciate you sharing your experience and your wisdom and your thoughts and ideas. So. Thank you everyone for coming. Be on the lookout later this week for the replay video and we hope to see you at the next webinar. Have a good night.